او خدای زنده و جاودان است و سلطنتش بی زوال و بی پایان اوست که نجات می بخشد و می رهاند و کارهای شگفتنگیز در آسمان و زمین انجام می دهد اوست که دانیال را از چنگ شیران نجات داد Good morning and welcome to Church South Valley. Uh, my name is, is Seth Kurtz and I'm one of the pastors here on staff. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, we are uh, going to continue in our series in the book of Daniel this morning, uh, but I do want to wish all of you a happy Memorial Day. I want to honor uh, those who we are to honor uh, on Memorial Day. Uh, but, but in addition to that, uh, there has been... Uh, some horrific events that have transpired this past week, and, uh, and I think it would be unhealthy for us as a church to move on as if nothing has happened. Uh, I think it is healthy for the church to be reminded to mourn with those who mourn, uh, to remember to be able to suffer alongside those who are suffering, uh, and to continue to pray against the darkness. And so what I'd, what I'd like to do this morning before we get into the message is to just ask you, church, if you would pray with me together. And as we pray, may we lean in closer to Jesus, the one who wept at the sight of death. May we pray against the darkness. And as we pray, may we remember Jesus, the one who laid down his life at the sight of evil. How fitting is it that this Memorial Day weekend, the people who we honor, the ones who laid down their lives at the side of evil, and yet here we are as a church, many of us not in the military, many of us not serving in this way, and evil has happened. And so I would just encourage you to pray against this darkness, to ask Jesus, where do I fit into your kingdom in a way that can push back against the darkness. Where can I be the light? And so would you pray with me this morning? Jesus, we are just thankful that no matter what happens, no matter what's going on in our world, we can be reminded that you are on the throne. No matter who's in charge here on earth, no matter who is calling shots, no matter what tragedy strikes, you have not lost control. And we thank you for that, Jesus. We pray that you would bring peace to the families who so desperately need that peace right now. We pray uh, that for even those who have survived this will be mentally traumatized for the rest of their lives. And Jesus, we pray that you would be present in that trauma, but continuing to work and to heal as only the great physician can. Jesus, we pray that we as a church could unite to be on mission for you and to bring light into the darkness, to refuse to be desensitized, and to understand, to know that this is not okay, and we will continue to push back against evil, Jesus. We pray that you would clearly show us, each one of us on an individual level, where uh, and what we can do to shine your light in our communities. Jesus, we pray this morning that your will be done here on earth as in heaven. We thank you for who you are. We trust you, and we are looking and waiting for you to move in mighty ways. And it's in your perfect name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. Now, if you've been with us these past few weeks, you know that we are neck deep in a series in the book of Daniel. Uh, have, have you all been enjoying this series? Okay, awesome, awesome. See, I absolutely love the Old Testament. So this has been great for me. We spend so much time as a church so often in the New Testament, but I am 
my, the, the Old Testament has my heart. And so, so I've been loving this. Uh, it's been phenomenal. And, and we're going to continue pushing through this morning. We've seen Daniel as he was taken into captivity, kidnapped from his home, taken into Babylon. And, uh, and, and when faced with decrees from the king on how his life would change, some of it he accepted, but some of it he knew went against the laws that God had ordered. And he said, no, I'm going to do this another way. And watch it work out even better than what your king thought would happen, right? We, we saw uh, Daniel, who was present when the king began to have nightmares. And Daniel was the only one who could interpret the dream and stood up for his friends, most of whom were even Babylonians themselves. We saw last week as the story shifted some, and we didn't see Daniel so much, but we saw his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we saw that as they were called to worship a golden image of the king, they said no. Even when they were faced with the threat of death, they said no. And as they were thrown into the furnace, they remained, they remained yet alive with Jesus by their side. And so uh, we move into this week in Daniel chapter 4, but before we get there, uh, I, I've, told, I've told most of you in the church before that I'm a, I'm a pretty big hockey fan, and uh, that's maybe kind of an understatement actually, but uh, specifically, I am a huge Anaheim Ducks fan, and uh, you may know them as the Mighty Ducks, that's okay, that was the better logo anyway, but uh, when, when Katie and I got married, she actually got me a Ducks jersey for our wedding gift that had my number on the back and our new name together on the back, right? Legitimately the best wedding gift that I ever got. I'd be willing to think maybe the best wedding gift anybody in here has ever gotten. But uh, the weird thing is that I still don't get to wear it because she's the one who always wants to wear it. But uh, so, so anyway, so now we're at the point where I'm like, okay, well, I've got to take her to a game now. But if I take her to a game, I've, I've got to wear a jersey too, right? And keep in mind, we're newlyweds, and uh, we can barely afford the electricity to run our swamp cooler that we had at the time. So I had this coworker at the time who he's like, oh, yeah, man, I've got, uh, I've got this place where we order from China, and the more people who we get in this order, the cheaper the jerseys are. And he's telling me, he's like, you can get a jersey for like $20. This sounds pretty good, right? Uh, now, if you ever find yourself at a hockey game, you will quickly find out that you will not find jerseys anywhere under $100, right? Uh, so eventually the jersey came, comes in. I'm beyond excited. I throw it on. I'm going. I'm standing in front of a mirror taking pictures, like doing all that stuff. I'm excited. But then, then we go to the game. We get out of the car and we throw our jerseys on. And I start looking at all the other people who are there, people walking into the stadium, and I realized that their jerseys look different than mine. Like, a lot different. Like, none of the colors match. <laughs> They're all very different. Now, I've told you before also that I am an introvert. So now at this point, I am certain that everyone is staring at me and thinking about this loser who just bought a fake jersey from China. Like, I didn't even know it was fake. I mean, it was $20, but... Uh, I, I like to pretend that I didn't know. And so for the rest of the night, all I wanted to do was take the jersey off and get people to stop looking at me, right? Sometimes, sometimes, church, we play Christianity. We see something that we like, so we throw the jersey on before we've really decided to commit to the team. Or, or you throw on the cheap version of the jersey, and if you weren't here last week, I'd encourage you, go back online, listen to the, ma the, the message uh, as, as Pastor Ricky shared about these three Hebrew boys who were thrown into a furnace and yet lived. Because as they came out, the evil king Nebuchadnezzar was so shocked that he promoted the three of them. And the chapter ends. And that's where we pick up this morning. So Daniel chapter 4 Starting in verse 1, we read this. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. 
How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. Now, this is pretty significant. Uh, and, And do you know how I know that it's significant? I know because I know that a good chunk of us aren't even this public with our praise after God comes through in a magnificent way. I've been the one to see God move and then forget to praise him because I'm too busy enjoying the comfort that he just provided. But think about this. This is the guy who just made a massive statue of himself and declared that anyone who does not bow down and worship the statue would be thrown into a furnace and burned alive. And three kids disobeyed. And he's furious and does what he said he would do. And then he turns around and worships their God. This is a really big deal. But it's also an old story. Because what happens when something goes wrong? As soon as comfort leaves, what happens to our attitude? We forget. We so consistently forget. See, moving to the very next verse, verse 4, we read this. Still Nebuchadnezzar, he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. That sounds pretty good, right? I'd be down for that. And then he goes on, he says, I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed and the fancies of the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in. And I told them the dream, but they could not make it known to me and its interpretation. At last, Daniel came in before me, he who was named Belshazzar, after the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and I told him the dream. Do you see that? Belshazzar. If you don't remember, that name means Prince of Baal the false god of the Babylonians, the false god of the Canaanites. This is who Nebuchadnezzar claims is his god. We are eight verses in, and this has gone in two very different directions very quickly. Just a moment ago, this looks so promising, but Nebuchadnezzar is just playing Christianity. He put on the fake jersey, and as soon as the real deal showed up, the king went back to his old team, to his old gods. How often do we do that, church? All it took was a bad dream for Nebuchadnezzar, and he was taking off his old jersey, or his new jersey, to go back to his old gods. And the unfortunate reality is I think so many times that we are not all that different We see some sort of media that concerns us, and suddenly we're running to our gods in political office. We're running to our green paper gods. We're seeking the gods who used to medicate us before we claimed our lives to Christ. Like, I have a bad day at work, and I come home, and I'm so quick to tell my wife, and listen, I know I'm not alone on this, that I need some comfort food, right? And I need like a lot of it. Like if it runs out, someone is definitely in trouble. I don't know who, probably whoever's closest. And and see, I know we don't talk about this often. But gluttony is a sin, church. And it's a sin that can very quickly become an idol. An idol that so many of us are quick to embrace. I still struggle. I still have to work to make Christ the sole love of my life. But that there is the key. You can't play Christian. You don't get to just throw on the jersey when you feel like it and then throw on a different jersey when there's two minutes left in the game and it looks like your team is losing. You're either all in on Jesus or you're not. 
Last week, we saw baptisms in both services, and it's this incredible declaration of allegiance to Jesus, right? Being taken down into the water and brought back up just as Jesus was buried and rose again to a new life. And on the back of the shirts that those baptism candidates were wearing is Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26, which says this, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Jesus does not take half allegiance. You're either all in or you're not at all, church. And Jesus is so serious about this that he calls us to pick up the most gruesome instrument of death in all of history. And he says, kill the flesh, kill the desires, kill the sin, kill the bondage, kill anything and everything that is not in allegiance to Jesus. Because here's the deal. When Jesus gets you, when he gets all of you, he makes sure that there is no hint of that enemy called death left on you it's gone. So if you're in, you better be ready to leave all of that behind. There's no turning back. There's no reminiscing of your old gods. They're dead and gone because you now belong to Jesus. Now, this is important because we're about to see Nebuchadnezzar's nightmare, and it's this unwillingness to let go that is what brings the judgment that he's about to hear. Now, before we read this passage, I need you to know that uh, I have friends, uh, friends here in this church who make fun of me because I can't read the Bible without going back to Genesis. Um, anybody who's in my small group is well aware of this because any topic we hit, I'm like, let's go to Genesis, right? We always go back to, it's just, guys, it's the best book in the Bible. I'm sorry. I know we all have our favorites, but this one is just, Genesis is the best. It's it's objective, not subjective. So just, you have to work with that. Uh, so this is, this is my book. Like, this book has my heart. Uh, so if you haven't yet, you should be in the book of Genesis by now. And so I want to remind you how reading biblical literature works. See, keep in mind that the biblical authors weren't sitting at their computers or their typewriters, anything like that. Uh, so it wasn't like they could put things in bold or italics Uh, They couldn't even put things in caps lock because guess what? That's all they had, right? Everything was in caps lock. I I think there was just something about ancient societies that screamed at each other all the time. And uh, so so what they would do instead is they would say something over and 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 on and on and on, right? So that you get it. You would see themes that begin repeating. You're going to see what I mean in a moment. So Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, and we read this. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, and the tree of life was in the midst of the garden. So uh, if we can go back to that real quick, hold on to this pleasant to sight, good for food, tree of life was in the midst of the garden, right? Take those, stick them in your pocket, hold on to them. Now we're going to go back a little bit further and hit Genesis 1.28, And it says, and God, this is right after God created humanity, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So take these, fill the earth, subdue it, dominion, birds of the heavens, every living thing that moves on the earth to the best that you can. Take those, tuck them away, stick them in your pocket, all right? So here we go, Daniel chapter 4 starting in the back half of verse 8 through verse 12. And I told him the dream, saying, O Belshazzar, king of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that no mystery is too difficult for you. Tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. The visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. And the tree grew and became strong, and its top reached to the heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. Did you see it all? 
Did you catch it? Here, let me, let me help you, okay? We've got the tree in the midst of the garden and the tree in the midst of the earth. We've got the tree of life giving life in heaven and the tree that reaches to heaven. We've got the tree that was pleasant to sight and its leaves were beautiful. We've got the tree that was good for food and its fruit was abundant. We've got every living thing that moves on the earth and we've got the beasts of the field. We've got the birds in the heavens and the birds in the heavens. See, here, here's what I'm saying. There's a lot of similarity. This is not coincidence, right? There's a lot going on here that this is how ancient Hebrews would write to make a point so that everybody who knew Genesis would know, oh, that's the story we're looking at. That's the context to have in my mind. So if I could just have a brief teaching moment, I did highlight a couple words in Genesis that we didn't actually see in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. When God created humanity and he made us in his image, he told humans to subdue the earth and to have dominion over it. God gave a position of rulership to rule alongside him. Nebuchadnezzar was living that vocation out in a very literal way by being a king. Now the difference, the difference is that in the Mesopotamian and Babylonian cultures, they had their own ideas about what it meant to be made in the image of a god. See, that was reserved exclusively for kings. Because kings, you see, it wasn't just that they would be a, a reflection of the gods. No, they actually became a physical manifestation or embodiment of those gods. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar, in his mind, was a god. He was equal with the God of Daniel. So in that very beginning where we saw what he was saying, he wasn't worshiping God exclusively. Nebuchadnezzar saw him as an equal, and it was time for God to confront this. See, as Christians, we know that all abundance comes from God. Amen? Amen. All over this dream was beauty and goodness. There was flourishing And so often we fall into the same trap Nebuchadnezzar fell into where we think that we've supplied the abundance and the beauty around us. Guess who becomes God in those moments? Church, do you know which idol is the hardest one to leave behind to become a follower of Jesus? It's ourselves. It's ourselves. See, I once had a friend who told me that the absolute worst insult that you can ever give someone is to tell them they're selfish. You know why? Because they are. Because we all are, and we know it. We run from it. We try to convince ourselves otherwise, but we know it. Like, I want to love my wife well, but when she asks if I can get up and get her a glass of water, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, you don't have legs, right? (laughs) She's not here this morning, so it's okay. She is watching online. I'll get in trouble later. (laughs) See, if I can be honest with you for a moment, though, like one of my biggest struggles is to pray. And the reason for that is my go-to instinct is to see a problem, address the problem, solve the problem. Where is God in that? That's a very good question. I'm still trying to figure it out. Let me know if you can find it. Pride and selfishness are so hard to put to death. It's so hard to leave those those behind you to become a fully committed follower of Jesus. And let me remind you of something, church. You make a terrible God. A few nights ago, my kids were having a hard time going to bed. Any parents relate to that one? My oldest is four. I got four, two, and one. And I mean, the nightmare was that they would never go to bed. And it's, I mean, They keep getting out of their beds, and they're fighting, and they're screaming, and they're throwing things, and they keep running out of their rooms and screaming at mom and dad, and they literally have a new need every 0.2 seconds, and I'm like, I can only do so many things, guys, plus you're not even supposed to be out of your beds right now. And I mean, this this had legitimately been going on for hours, and Katie and I have just gotten to the point where we're at our wit's end. And so finally, I hear Felicity, my daughter, I, I hear her crying like she just got hurt, And so I run into the room, and she points at her brother, Parker, 
and I let him have it. I mean, this is a moment that I honestly, honestly failed as a dad because I let my emotions dictate how to treat a two-year-old. I put him back in his bed, and I slammed the door and left. That was the last noise my kids made before they went to sleep that night. Now, we have a camera in their bedroom, and my wife checked it and saw that Felicity lied. Parker didn't do anything wrong. He never hurt her. He was just laying in his bed trying to go to sleep. And then I saw myself on that camera storm into the room. When I realized what I did wrong, I, I went back in the room to apologize to him, and he was already asleep. And so to the parents out there, I don't know if you've ever had the moment where you just feel like your kids deserve better than what you can give them, but this was it for me. This was it. I felt that there was nothing I could do but just to rub my hand on his back and just shed a few tears, because I messed up. But the reminder is that I make a terrible God. What pride promises is a lie. I thank God that he's a better father to my children than I will ever be. And I would honestly never have it any other way. I will continue to strive to be the best father they can have, to be the best father any child has ever had. But I always know that God remains a better father to my kids than I can ever be. And this dream that Nebuchadnezzar is having is a reminder to him that all the goodness around him is from the creator God. It's not from Marduk, the Babylonian God. It's not from Baal, the Canaanite God. It's not from any other pagan God. It's from Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Daniel. And so here's the application. Get your humility figured out. Get your humility figured out, Nebuchadnezzar. Get your humility figured out, South Valley. Get your humility figured out, Seth. Either you kill your pride or it kills you. Nebuchadnezzar moves on in his dream into verse 13. And he says, I saw the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and lop off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth." Let his mind be changed from a man's, and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. This dream I, Nebuchadnezzar, saw, and you, O Belshazzar, tell me the interpretation." Because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. So as we read this, we have to remember the Genesis is still on the brain, right? When, when you read this through the lens of an ancient Hebrew, that would certainly be something that you're still considering. And the driving component of what it means to be human is to be made in the image of God. And right alongside that, God calls us to subdue and have dominion over all earth and over all the beasts. And as a reminder, Nebuchadnezzar considers being the image of God something totally different. And here's the stark warning. You are what you image. Last week, Ricky warned us that we are what we worship. Well, we worship God by imaging him well. And Nebuchadnezzar was ultimately worshiping self. And imaging anything less than God will turn you into something less than human. God is warning the king that though he should have dominion over the beasts, he himself would become a beast. Truly, the only way to be human is to follow Jesus and to image God well. 
Anything other than that would result in the dehumanization of yourself and those around you. And in this stark comparison to Genesis, we see something that could be so beautiful, so fruitful, so lovely. We see this tree that reaches all the way to the heavens, producing life through its abundant fruit. We see it providing shade for all of creation. And then out of heaven comes this messenger, and he says, chop it down. Cut it down. No wonder this is a nightmare for Nebuchadnezzar. God was in the midst of confronting Nebuchadnezzar after the fiery furnace, making it clear to him that being impressed with God is not the same as being converted by God. Let me say that again, church. Being impressed with God is not the same as being converted by God. It's a hard thing in our world to see things that we thought would be great, that we thought uh, would continue to hold beauty, that we thought should be honored, and to see those things chopped down. But God is not in the business of sharing His glory. God is for God. And the beauty of this, that God is for God, is that Jesus is God. And Jesus, as we see time and time again, Jesus is for grace Jesus is for redemption. Jesus is for conversion. Jesus is for second and third and fourth and fifth chances. This is what Jesus is for. And so how many times have you chosen yourself over God? How many times have you let your pride win and have you given God a reason to turn his back on you? And yet, he fights for you. And yet he wants you. And yet he pursues you. It's not because you're great, but it's because God is great. So Jesus is calling for your full allegiance. When you read through the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see that that there were these massive crowds that would follow Jesus around. Do you want to know why they followed Jesus everywhere? It wasn't because they accepted him as the king of kings. It was because they wanted to see a miracle. They wanted to see a show. These people would follow Jesus because they were impressed with him. But that was a far stretch from conversion. These massive crowds that followed Jesus everywhere, and yet when it came time to be on mission for Jesus, there were only 70 that he sent out. Jesus wants you, but are you just impressed by what he can offer without being converted? Are you just here for the cheap knockoff jersey, or are you prepared to say that Jesus can have all of you? Paul writes in the book of Colossians in chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, he gives this phenomenal description of Jesus. And he says this, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on heaven or whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. In the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, the watcher declared that the Most High would have a kingdom that would never be shaken and would never end. It would be a different kind of kingdom. And Jesus proved himself to be the king of this unique kingdom. He came as the only perfect image bearer. He, God in the flesh, met us where we were and offered us to enter into a different kind of kingdom. One not ruled by oppressive rulers, but instead by a benevolent king. A king who loves, a king who fights for justice, a king who fights for what is right, and a king who will one day make all things right. 
Colossians tells us that, that he's the firstborn from the dead. The firstborn. And this is important for us because Nebuchadnezzar is terrified by this image of a tree being chopped down. And Jesus, Jesus is reminding us that though he raised from the dead, that's just the beginning. Jesus had this good friend Martha, and there's this point in the gospel accounts when her brother dies. And Jesus asks her if she knows about the resurrection. She says, yes, I know that in the end, all will be resurrected. This is the beautiful thing about Jesus. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, the cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering, which every man must experience, is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old man, which is the result of his encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. And thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. What makes us beautiful? Resurrection. Resurrection makes it beautiful. Even a chopped down tree can be brought back to life. When Christ, when what Christ chops down, he chops down with the intent of growing back in a new and better way. Shortly after Martha's brother died, Jesus raised him back to life, but Jesus made clear that that resurrection was just the start of something far more beautiful. What Christ did on Easter he is doing to all of creation. Christ bids us to come and die because that is truly the only way that we can ever fully live. We've seen multiple times now that Nebuchadnezzar has celebrated and commanded worship for God. But he remains struggling with that call to come and die. He's a king, for goodness sake, right? He has so much to live for. He has so much power, so much freedom, so much authority. He doesn't want to risk that. And then there's us. We have so much. Man, we are blessed here in America. Regardless how much you have right now, life could be so much worse. So when we're faced with that call to come and die and reminded that it's a daily call? That's hard. That's a tough ask. But it's only in your willingness to put to death the brokenness bound to you that Jesus can bring resurrection to the only true way to live. Here's what I want us to learn from Daniel this week. Time and time again, when the king, the evil king, was distraught and needed help he knew who he could turn to. He knew who he could count on. It wasn't the greatest Babylonians. It was Daniel. The one who followed a different God. Daniel was so good at imaging God and reflecting his goodness and his light in a dark culture that the people who could actually make a difference looked to Daniel for help. Do you want to make a difference in your home? Be like Jesus. Do you want to make a difference in your city? Be like Jesus. Do you want to make a difference in this country? Be like Jesus. It's not about being like Daniel because Daniel was working on following somebody else. Somebody greater. The true king. Jesus. Jesus. So let us learn from Daniel how important it is for us to press deeply into Jesus and not to separate ourselves from the world, but to distinguish ourselves from the world so that the rest of the world would know that when they are in desperate need for goodness, they can look to those who call Jesus Lord. So three practical steps I want to encourage you to take today. Number one, come and die. Put to death your sin. Confess your brokenness. Find the healing that only Jesus can give you. But when Jesus calls you, there's a life to be left behind. Come and die. 
Number two, stop playing Christian. It's time to go all in, to be the church. Jesus was for the broken, the hurting, and the oppressed. How are you for what Jesus is for, even if it's difficult? Even if the hurting and broken is the king who's making all things chaos? How do you show the love of Jesus? And number three, draw near to God. The closer we get to God, the harder it is to be prideful. We all struggle with it, but God can and will defeat it. But only if we begin to humble ourselves and draw close to him. I realize that these are not easy applications. But this is why nobody in here is in here alone. This is a community. This is a body of people who are saying, not only do I want to follow Jesus, but I want to do it with all of you. We're in this together, church. Things will get hard. It will be hard to stay consistent and faithful to God as life gets difficult, as there are people in our lives calling us away from that. But to do these things requires that we do them together. We partner in that community. That we love the way Jesus loved and do it through the vehicle that he put here, the church. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for just your goodness, for for your sacrifice for us, for your pursuit of us, for your love for us. Jesus, may we be your hands and feet well. May we learn the lesson that you came to teach to Nebuchadnezzar. May we learn to lay down our pride. May we learn to make you the only God, the only love of our lives. And may we do it in a way that that reflects the way that Daniel did it. So in pursuit of you, Christ, that the rest of the world needs us, that the rest of the world wants us. That even if we're countercultural, even if we're rebellious against the things of this world, that they would see that we are so for the love of Christ that we can't help but overflow that love out to others. Jesus, I just ask that if there's anyone here this morning who does not know your love, who has not stepped in relationship with you, that you would be working on their heart, that you would be drawing them, that you would be loving them, that you would be showing them so clearly that you are for them and you love them with a love that they could never fathom. And Jesus, may we all, in response, lay our lives at your feet. Do with us as you want, Jesus. We're not our own. We belong to you. It's in your perfect name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. I hope that you'll join us next week. If you need prayer, we will be up here in the front, and we would love to pray with you. God bless.